So today's topic is diffusion. Many processes and reactions in materials are in, involves the diffusion of atoms, like heat treatments, corrosion, many significant processes that are taking place in a material system. It always includes diff diffusion. So it is very important to understand diffusion, the flow of atoms, and what are the factors that are affecting. And one example I just remember, for example, oxidation, phase changes, phase transformations, going from one phase to another. This all these type of processes that are taking place in a material system, they all include atomic motion, right? That is what we call diffusion, net flow of atoms due to a concentration gradient. So therefore, we're going to cover diffusion in this chapter. So these are the questions we're going to look. What is diffusion? And what type of uh, diffusions there are? And what are examples of diffusions in material processing? And the mathematical equations we use to describe the diffusion, the atomic motion. And, of course, the temperature is very important in uh, determining the rate of diffusion because diffusion is what we call thermally activated process. As the temperature increases, diffusion also increases. That is the reason why at high temperatures, materials are more susceptible to corrosion because corrosion is a process where atomic motion is very important. And when we increase the temperature, this atomic motion, atom movements, the rate of them is increasing. Therefore, corrosion is increasing. So how are we going to see how the, the rate of diffusion depends on the temperature? Okay, so these are the questions we're going to look. Okay, as I said, diffusion is defined by mass transport by atomic motion. So the mechanism of diffusion is in gases and liquids, it's just a random motion. And in solids, there is vacancy diffusion, we're going to learn, and interstitial diffusion. So interdiffusion is diffusion of atoms of one material into another. So we're going to see an example. And self-diffusion is atomic migration in a pure metal. So it is basically all atoms exchanging positions are of the same. So when this is self-diffusion. But the process of by which atoms of one metal diffuse into another, that is called interdiffusion. Okay, let's see examples. So one thing we need to understand is there has to be a concentration gradient or concentration difference as a driving force for atoms to move, uh, my, to go from one place to another, basically. And the tendency for this, of course, atoms they tend to migrate from regions of high concentration to low concentration. So, let's say we have a diffusion cup couple. The copper and nickel metals, bars, are joined together. Let's say these orange atoms are copper and the gray ones representing nickel. 
and they are joined and then this couple is heated to a elevated temperature but it should be below the melting point okay below the melting point their melting points and then uh, heated for to an elevated temperature and keep kept that temperature for a certain period of time so before we do that if we look at the if we look actually let's erase this how with position the concentration of copper and nickel atoms are changing so remember orange is the copper right so and i am looking at the graph with position so initially here there when uh, when i move along the material edge so it is 100 percent copper 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 but when i come to the interface suddenly it dropped to zero percent of copper because it's all nickel and the copper concentration is zero here but when you look at the nickel uh, along the position uh, as a function of position it is zero 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 percent nickel and when i reach the interface suddenly there is we go to hundred percent copper so this is before we are actually uh, just attaching just putting these materials together but not doing any heat treatment but after we increase the temperature and kept the material this couple at uh, that temperature for a certain period of time and then after that we cool it down back to the room temperature and then let's say we are doing chemical analysis and we want to look at how the interface looks like now okay so after diffusion of course with the heat some diffusion takes place right atoms move towards each other they're gonna move from where they are at high concentration to where they are at low concentrations so copper is gonna move towards nickel because inside the nickel uh, there is low concentration of copper of course the nickel is gonna move towards copper because inside copper it's at low concentration right so they are moving towards each other and therefore if we look at the same diagram for the how the concentration changes as a function of position after the diffusion takes place we can see that if we look at let's choose the colors first let's look at the copper again far away from the interface we still have 100 percent copper but now when we approach towards the interface the concentration decreases but not an abrupt decrease right slowly decreases and then reaches zero percent and the same is for the copper uh, nickel now right so as we reach the interface it is quickly increasing the nickel position the nickel concentration and then it is reaching 100 percent when we are far away so this is what they observed right and when they did this experiment so these are concentration profiles that are showing us that when we actually uh, form couples like that and give them some energy like heat the atoms will have enough energy and enough driving force because there is concentration difference and they will move towards each other diffuse to each other okay so in this case this is an example of interdiffusion right because the copper have migrated into nickel and nickel have migrated into copper here right so let's write it down Inter okay, this is interdiffusion example 
okay so we said the self diffusion was migration of host atoms in pure metals so to be able to understand that of course we are looking at a pure metal right so all atoms they are the same so we might be thinking how come these atoms are gonna move and actually that is always happening in a material so the atom doesn't stay at its position okay it moves around the material that's what we call self diffusion in a pure material so to be able to of course understand that since all atoms are the same we have labeled the atoms let's say a b c d a atom b atom and d atom and when diffusion takes place actually all those atoms are now in different places of course the material will look like the same to you but those atoms actually moved uh, along inside the material so let's look at different diffusion mechanisms The first one is vacancy diffusion. So as the name implies, this involves the interchange of an atom from its normal lattice position to, a, to an adjacent vacant site or vacancy. And this is also shown schematically here. Okay, so for vacancy diffusion to takes place to take place there has to be vacancy sites in the structure and we learned uh, the equilibrium number of vacancies the, that are in the material and how it is affected with the temperature right so there has there is always vacancies present but when we increase the temperature the concentration of vacancies uh, increase so this also affects the vacancy diffusion because for vacancy diffusion to take place there has to be vacancies in the structure and of course the atom need to have a certain energy to be able to move from its original spot to the vacancy side So atomic motion and the vacancy motion are happening in opposite directions, of course, because as we see in the in this, let's say this is the same copper and nickel uh, couple. The copper is diffusing into the vacancy side here, right? Let me draw it again. So copper is from here going to the vacancy side here so copper motion is going this direction of course when this happened vacancy moves towards the copper okay so vacancy comes here the copper atom goes there both self diffusion and inter diffusion occur by this mechanism and in self diffusion of course the pure uh, metal pure atoms um, in the pure metal will exchange positions with the vacancies and the example for the interdiffusion is here the copper and nickel copper right like the one we seen right here so of course the diffusion rate will depend on as we said the number of vacancies and the activation energy to exchange position with the vacancy. As we are seeing in the image, now the vacancy moved here in the structure, right? From here to here it moved. So when we go to the next uh, image of the same material, now vacancy is right here. And now another atom will move towards the vacancy side. So this will come here. And this place will be vacancy. So this is uh, with time how the material, how the vacancy is moving or how the atoms are moving along inside the material. Okay.
so another uh, diffusion mechanism is interstitial diffusion this involves atoms that migrate from an interstitial position to a neighboring one that is empty this mechanism is especially important for interdiffusion of impurities impurities like hydrogen carbon nitrogen and oxygen it is easy to understand right basically the atoms that are in interstitial positions move from one interstitial position to another so this is more rapid than vacancy diffusion and think about why this can be one reason is interstitial atoms are smaller so they are easy it can easily move okay they are more mobile and also the probability of having another empty interstitial site is much higher compared to having a vacancy position next to the atom so therefore this is like a probability also right so the probability of having a vacancy uh, next to the atom is much less than the probability of having an interstici empty interstitial site next to another interstitial site. Therefore, interstitial diffusion is faster than vacancy diffusion. Okay, so we are given an example there were a process, a material processing technique where the diffusion is important. This material processing technique is called case hardening and this is done to enhance the surface properties of a material. So how it is done? Basically, carbon atoms are diffused into the iron on the surfaces. Let's say we have a gear like shown in the image and outside this region you can see difference in color also the surface that is hardened by the diffusion of carbon atoms into the surface so why do we do that because it enhances the properties like wear resistance of the gear and improve properties like resistance to fatigue failure which uh, we're gonna see later in chapter six when we look at mechanical properties what is fatigue failure etc but this is just a surface uh, treatment of materials where we use diffusion of carbon to enhance the surface characteristics of certain materials and an example of how uh, diffusion is important to understand how diffusion is affected with certain parameters like temperature temperature uh, concentration gradients etc so when we look at the mathematical equations we're going to understand the which parameters are affecting the diffusion and diffusion rate another example where the diffusion uh, uh, is used in the processing is uh, when we create semiconducting devices so we diffuse a small concentration of atoms of impurities into silicon and in this case phosphorus is diffused into silicon and this is a process called doping as you can see uh, phosphorus rich layers are attached to the surface of a silicon and then we heat treat of course there's always heat involved because it enhances diffusion rate and then therefore we are seeing the phosphorus is diffused into the silicon and formed regions 
semiconductor regions inside the silicon. So this is another technique where the diffusion of atoms are important to understand. What are the parameters that are controlling the diffusion? Because these are important to understand when we are actually doing the processing of these materials. Okay, so diffusion is a time-dependent process. Of course, it will take time for atoms to diffuse from one place to another, right? And as a function of time, how much they diffuse, it's going to change. And how do we define the rate of diffusion? <coughs> With a term, J, we call flux, okay? So this is in units of mass per area per time. So basically what is it? Mass of diffused species per area per time. So mass over area time. Okay, so this is a very general definition. And how do they measure it? They measure it experimentally. So if you have a thin sheet of uh, material, let's say like that, and one side you have certain amount of something at certain concentration, let's say copper in this side, and other side it is zero, let's say the concentration, so the copper ill will diffuse through it, right? And so they measure it as a function of time, how much copper diffused, and the slope of course is gonna give you the flux with the area information this is a fixed area right cross-sectional area uh, don't worry about this equation here okay so basically this is a general definition of uh, uh, the rate of diffusion basically it is defined by flux which is the mass of diffused species per area per time and how they measure this they measure it experimentally to figure out the rate of diffusion. So there are two types, okay? Steady state diffusion and non-steady state diffusion. Fic steady state diffusion is explained by Fick's first law. And we're going to see this announced steady state is for fixed second law. And in steady state diffusion, rate of diffusion or flux independent of time. And it is independent of time and the concentration gradient across uh, the material is the same throughout okay so the relationship it was found how the flux it's actually proportional to the concentration gradient okay so concentration gradient means the how the concentration of diffusing species changes along the thickness and if you take a look at that the blue is your material let's say uh, at a position changing from the thickness is changing from a position of x1 to x2 and the distance is the difference you can say is x and one side of that material we have a concentration of diffusing species c1 on the other side it is c2 so c2 is lower than c1 therefore from higher concentration to uh, lower concentration the species will diffuse and oh this is this is showing you from c1 to c2 there is a constant there is a constant uh, concentration gradient so therefore the ex expression for the flux when it is fixed first law is given to us through that equation which is the flux is equal to minus d and times the concentration gradient 
and this relationship this proportionality constant is actually between the flux and the concentration gradient is given to us with diffusion coefficient So let's see this example. We have um, methylene chloride is a common ingredient of paint removers. Besides being an irritant, it also may be absorbed through the skin. When using this paint remover, protective gloves should be worn. Let's investigate whether uh, rubber gloves uh, commonly found in kitchen can be used so the maximum allowable flux for 150 pound person is less than this okay so the flux is given to us compute the diffusion flux of methylene chloride through the gloves okay let's compute it Okay, so the idea here is we have a paint remover which we don't want it to diffuse through the skin. The skin is on the other side and in the protection we put gloves, right? So we need to look at the diffusion flux or diffusion rate of this paint remover through the gloves into the skin if this is possible, okay? Because there is an allowable limit. And let's see what is the flux. Of course, certain information has to be given to you, right? So by fixed first law, the flux is minus D times the concentration gradient. Here the minus sign represents diffusion occurs down a concentration gradient. So that negative sign is only uh, for a direction, okay, since this is C2 minus C1 and we are saying uh, the diffusion is happening from higher concentration to lower concentration. That's why there is minus. There is, uh, the minus is always just an indication of the direction of the uh, diffusion. Okay, so certain things has to be given to us, such as D, the fusion coefficient in the units of area per second, and concentration difference C1 and C2 of the paint remover uh, on both sides, and what is the uh, what is the thickness of the glove. This was given to us, right? So all we have to do is just plug it in. In the equation, basically, we know the diffusion coefficient, we know the concentrations across the graph, and then the thickness. Look at the units, they are centimeter good. And then, uh, and when we do that calculation, basically, we found this is the flux mass uh, flowing per area per time. Okay, so if we look at the allowable uh, flux though, it was right there. And if we compare it, this is more than 30 times of the allowable flux. So it is not good, right? So this is unsafe to use these gloves for paint removal. So we need to look at other alternatives, which will not allow the diffusion of this uh, chemical to our skin, basically. So we have learned the diffusion coefficient D is in the flux equation, right? The rate of diffusion. But the diffusion coefficient is actually changes with temperature. So it has a temperature dependency. And as the temperature increases, diffusion coefficient increases. So there has to be a relationship between the diffusion coefficient 
and the temperature. So therefore, uh, through probability uh, calculations, etc., there are equations that was found, which defines the diffusion coefficient and it de its dependency to temperature. And that equation is given to us uh, by this equation given here. Okay, so the diffusion coefficient is equal to some constant d naught and an exponential term here q is the activation energy for diffusion d and of course there is gas constant r and the temperature is has to be in kelvins okay don't forget that so if we want to plot that equation, of course, D, how it changes with temperature. This is the uh, function. This equation is basically plotted in here. And we can see how it changes. Of course, it's another linear change if we look at the D and T. But if we transform the data, meaning taking logarithms, and this will take the exponential term uh, outside of the exponential term, right? This one. And, and try if we write that equation here, so take the logarithm ln, natural logarithm ln in both, of both sides of this equation, right? You guys need to understand how to do that, right? This is going to be ln d is equal to ln d naught. Minus, of course, this exponential term is going to get out, right? It's going to be the activation energy over uh, RT. So this is a line equation, actually, with a negative slope. If you plot ln d, this is y, right? Y axis. And if this is your 1 over t is here, your x. Uh, the slope is going to give us activation energy in formation. Okay. But it is easier in the problems to sometimes work with, with the logarithmic form of this equation. Okay, let's see. So, okay. So this equation tells us actually with increasing temperature the diffusion coefficient d is also increasing okay if we plot this relation between d and the temperature of course the temperature here um this is 1 over 1000 kelvin over temperature here basically it is done it, it is um so they multiply 1 over t with 10 to the power of 3 because they wanted to write integer numbers here on the axis okay so normally this is one was 1 over t uh, basically times um, 1000 okay so this way uh, you can write integer numbers for different temperatures right and the temperatures are also shown in the above uh, axis here okay so as you see when I move towards this direction the temperature is actually decreasing of course 1 over T is increasing because that's the reciprocal of temperature. So if we plot uh, the information of diffusion coefficient, basically diffusion coefficient equation for different systems like the copper diffusion in iron, aluminum diffusion in aluminum, that's self diffusion right and iron diffusion in different types of iron so if you experimentally collect the data and uh, plot it uh, d versus temperature what we are seeing here is the thing that i told you guys so as we decrease the temperature uh, 
okay the diffusion coefficient decreases for all types of systems so or in other words as you increase the temperature diffusion coefficient increases uh, for material system okay which is expected right because heat given uh, energy to atoms to move around so which is expected There is also another information we see because if you look at uh, this is the purple is carbon in iron, carbon in iron, different forms of iron, right? Because we learned polymorphism and iron can be BCC and FCC. So carbon diffusion in alpha iron and gamma iron, the, the alpha iron is um, BCC, gamma iron is FCC. So uh the diffusion the diffusion is interstitial diffusion because the carbon is goes into the interstitial sites in iron so when we are talking about uh self diffusion or substitutional al aluminum goes into aluminum spots right or iron goes into al iron so we can compare the interstitial diffusion coefficients with substitutional ones and we say that the interstitial diffusion coefficient is much higher. Atoms move faster, right? Because we understand that because carbon atoms are small in an iron system and we expect the diffusion coefficients to be higher compared to substitutional uh, diffusions coefficients. Okay, so this is another information we get. So this is the screenshots of virtual material science and engineering database and I told you I gave you the link for this in the in the pages that I shared with you in Canvas. So we are given a screenshot of diffusion plots magnesium in aluminum. In that uh, software, in that database, if you enter diffusion species and host atoms, some information about diffusion coefficients and activation energies, which we're going to see in the tables next, okay? And it, it generates you this plot, basically, D versus 1 over T. That's it. So this is similar to what we learned here, right? This one. So here we are asked to derive an equation that relates the diffusion coefficients of the same system but at different temperatures. So we know that with temperature diffusion coefficient change but from it goes from let's say D1 to D2 right with different temperature but for the same system. And uh, we are asked what is the relationship between uh, D1 and D2 basically. And this relationship is going to be important when you are solving equations, um, problems about diffusion. Okay, so let's see uh, how we can derive it. One thing I would like to mention here is that diffusion coefficient depends on the temperature. Okay, and we know that. So, but the D naught, the constant depends only on the system so if your system is the same the not constant is not going to change okay so for the same system if we want to write the, the basic the diffusion coefficient equation logarithmic form of that uh, for the same system but different temperatures which are giving us different diffusion coefficients and of course we can write this one right ln D2 is equal to ln D0 minus Q, the activation energy over R. What changes is 1 over T2. Okay. The same thing you write it for the another diffusion coefficient of the same system. So if you look at both of these equations, and actually uh, 
uh, sold it for um, L and D0 because that's the same in both equations and has to be equal to each other, right? So let me try to do it here. And of course, activation energies are the same, okay? For for one atom to from one move from one place to another place. So I solved both equation for ln d naught, and the the ln d naught is the same for both equation. So that means this term here has to be equal to this one and this cancels out uh, d naught right we don't need d naught anymore here so if we again rearrange this this is how it's going to look like right so this comes to that side ln d naught the ln d2 minus ln d1 which is equal to also because this is a minus sign and uh, because of the properties of the, uh, ln, we can, instead of minus, we can write ln d2 over d1. That's fine. And then we have, on the other hand side, uh, q over r parenthesis is possible because the q over r is the same. So it's going to be 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1 with the negative sign here. Okay. Uh, you can also write it if you want um, to write it in the exponential form. You can also write it this way. Okay, now let's solve a problem. Since we derived the equation which relates the diffusion coefficient of the same system at different temperatures. Okay, so let's solve it. At 300 degrees C, the diffusion coefficient and activation energy for copper in silicon are. So we have a silicon and copper is going to diffuse into it. And diffusion coefficient is given. Of course, it has to diff come with the temperature because the diffusion coefficient changes with temperature, right? So at 300 degrees C, we are given the diffusion coefficient is this. So sometimes you it might not be given like this, but sometimes you might need to read it from a table. And also the activation energy for the copper silicon system is given. It doesn't depend on the temperature, it depends on the system. So compute the diffusion coefficient at 350. So we are given the diffusion coefficient of this, uh, uh, for a system at certain temperature and we are asked for the same system what happens if we change the temperature how the diffusion coefficient changes and we now learn that there's a relationship between d2 and d1 and it is given from this equation that we calculated okay so all we have to do is plug in the information we are given so the temperatures has to be kelvin so change those to Kelvin and plug it into your equation. R is a constant which is given and Q is given. You need to be careful to which, what is the unit of R. Since the unit of R is joules, it includes joules. So unit of the activation energy should be converted from kilojoules to joules. So you need to be careful in those units. And then the fusion coefficient at uh, d1 for d1 is given. Plug it in and basically calculate the, what to expect in terms of the diffusion coefficient in the, at, the, at a higher temperature, which we expect it to be higher. So if you compare d1 and d2, you will see that d2 is higher because it is an increased temperature compared to 300. Now we are at 350.
Okay, so as I described you guys, there is steady state and non-steady state. In the steady state, the concentration gradient across the so, uh, across the film or across the thickness was the same. But in reality, uh, there are situations where that concentration gradient is not going to stay the same. Because as the species are diffusing from one point to another, the concentration on both sides of a, a thickness basically will be, uh, it will be changing with time. So therefore, non-steady state diffusion is happening if the concentration of diffusion diffusing species is a function of both time and position. So C, the concentration of diffusion, diffusing species, depends on X, the thickness, time, I mean the uh, position, and the T is the time. Okay, so we are writing it. C is a function of uh, X and T. So this is defined with fixed second law equation. And you can see in the equation the dependence of the concentration to time and the thickness. The time is included in that equation. And so in this form of equation, the diffusion coefficient is, uh, of course, independent of the concentration. Uh, and it is defined as the same way, right? The D is depending on activation energy. Uh, um, depends on the type of system basically over the temperature so uh, this is how the fixed second uh, equation is given here what does it say actually the rate of compositional change is proportional to the rate of change of the concentration gradient rather than the concentration gradient itself like it was in the fixed uh, first law okay so so this is a differential equation uh, and uh, we need to solve it okay so how do they solve it they need to define some boundary conditions to solve this equation and relate the concentration, time, thickness, and diffusion coefficient. Okay, so uh, to as I said to the to solve this equation, basically uh, we need um, boundary conditions. Okay, let's see. So how does these boundary conditions gonna be defined? Okay, so we have some definitions here. Let's consider the diffusion of copper shown with the uh, orange dots here uh, into a bar of aluminum. Okay, here is the bar we are seeing right there. Okay. So first, what is the pre-existing concentration of copper atoms in the bar? C naught, right? C naught is gonna be defining. Uh, what is the initial concentration of diffusing, diffusing species, the copper? What is it, right? And CS, C with the subscript S, is the surface concentration of copper uh, at the surface of the aluminum. Okay, so if we look at, at time zero, at time zero, the concentration, which depends on, remember, x and time, and the concentration is equal to C naught at time zero. Because at time zero, we know the concentration of diffusing species in the, in the bar is equal to C naught. Right. So at a time that is bigger than zero, When x, when we are at the surface, right, when x is 0, the concentration equals to surface concentration. At a, con at a time bigger than 0, 
when we are far away, x is infinity, right? Far away from the surface, the concentration is going to be equal to the initial concentration. Far away, right? Far away. Okay, so these are defining boundary conditions to solve that differential equation. Okay, that's it. Of course, also, if you look at this figure, we are seeing how the time is important uh, in terms of understanding the concentration change with time of the copper diffusing species. So at a time zero and x zero, when we are here, uh, we are seeing that the concentration is actually uh, C naught, right? But with time, it is starting with, so if along the position of the aluminum, of course, we start from here and move along the bar, okay? So we start, the concentration starts at the surface with CS, and uh, as we move, move along the bar, it, it is uh, actually increasing increasing concentration with increasing time okay so so at this position for example you see that with time the concentration of copper is increasing okay so we don't have to worry about how this equation was solved uh, given the boundary conditions because we are given the solutions of it okay so how this concentration changes uh, relate to time and thickness how it depends on it and th that is when we solve that part, differential equation this is the solution that we are going to use so this is the solution of fixed second law If we look at the terms in the equation, the C as a function of X and T is defining as the concentration of the diffusion, diffusing species at any point X at any time. So any point along the bar, right, at any time, we are, uh, let's say at this point, it's uh, some five seconds later, what is the concentration of copper let's say okay that is that term is defining so <clears throat> there is error function this is general error function which the solutions are found in literature okay so this error comes from the way uh, the we solve the part uh, the differential equation so it is not it's some mathematics okay so we don't have to worry all i need to tell you guys this error function is found from tables okay so it is it is said that z and we, i mean inside the error function and the error function will be given to us in table 5.1 okay so i guess that table is uh in our book but Anyhow, we will use it in the problems and then I will also, yeah, so I saw that in your book table 5.1 is giving you error function and then you don't even need that. You can Google it and you, what is the error function and uh, you can see the images that, that you can find the error function there and then we're going to do examples to understand that. So if we want to see in a figure how, how in a chart how the this equation is plotted actually as a function of distance from the interface. So starting from here and moving inside the material bar, how the concentration is changing of the diffusing species. It starts at the surface with the surface concentration as we move inside. Uh, it is, of course, uh, decreasing with distance and it also depends on the time, right? So, 
so at a certain distance let's say this point uh, we will have a concentration of those species uh, at a certain point at a certain time the initial concentration of these species within the bar uh, we achieve it far away right because the far away we are so far away from the surface we are still preserving the amount of initial concentrations inside of that diffusing species inside the material and usually this can be zero right because initially uh, there might not be any of those diffusing species unless you are diffusing carbon into steel because the steel has already has carbon inside and so start with you start with some sorting C not volume anyhow let's see a problem an FCC iron carbon alloy initially contained 0.28% carbon is carburized at an elevated temperature and in an atmosphere in which the surface carbon concentration is maintained at one weight percent so we are given so there is a, a alloy right and carburized mean the carbon is introduced so carbon is diffusing so of course it has some surface concentration of the carbon and it has some initial concentration so we are said that initially of course it has some iron 0.2 that is given to you right and then the surface concentration is maintained in one percent so after 49.5 hours so the time is given to us the concentration of carbon is 0.35 at the position 4 mm below the surface so you move 4 mm below the surface come here and at, uh, at the time 49.5 hours 4 mm in depth we have a concentration of carbon that is 0.35 this is giving us the concentration at a certain distance at a certain time now determine the temperature at which the treatment was carried out so we are asked temperature okay now let's look at the this is first of all you need to understand this is a fixed second law problem problem okay so there is time in it so when the time is in the problem that means we are talking about fixed second law and we are given enough information to plug it into our fixed second law equation but where does this so we need to solve it with temperature right force temperature but where does this for a temperature information coming from you gotta remember diffusion coefficient depends on temperature right so first we need to solve this to figure out the d diffusion coefficient and then we remember how the diffusion coefficient is related to the temperature and from that equation i can find the temperature so our uh, fixed second law equation is given the solution now all i have to do is plug in the information that we just uh, figured out from the problem that is given in the problem and then calculate the <coughs> equation basically let's see what we can we gonna do okay so we said uh, concentration at a per certain time certain distance was 0.35 so we put it there and initially the carbon concentration was 0.2 just put 0.2 so all units are the same you don't have to deal with any other thing just put 0.2 right so all of these are percentages so as long as the all units are the same you're fine so in the surface concentration is one percent so put one and c naught is again 0.2 which is equal to 1 minus error function and with inside the error function is given so from here you solve this for error function okay so because you can solve this part one is here basically 1 minus that is equal to the error function 
Now what we want is we, we know the value of the error function but we want is the term inside. The term inside is simplified as z. So you have to look at the tables for that as I described to you guys. So these uh, Gaussian error functions they are tabulated in the tables you can find anywhere and it is also in our book table 5.1 and the part of a table uh, how we read the information can be seen in this uh, in this problem so the part of the that table is given so we are given what in the table we are given if the what is the error function values and how we can how it is related to what is inside so if the error function of z is this z must be that okay so we therefore we need to calculate it ourselves sometimes the exact value of the error function might not be there in the table that that's when you need to do linear interpolation and i hope you guys learned what linear interpolation is and if you don't i suggest you google it and wikipedia is clearly explaining it but we're gonna see an example here okay so when we look at the table we are seeing that error function is for this value of error function inside the error function is this right and we also know from the table this is if error function is that uh, our um, inside the error function z is 0.95 so now what is our value for error function our value is 0.8125 so it is in between these therefore you put it in between so i'm trying to find the corresponding z and it should be in between 0.9 and 0.95 so to be able to do that we, we do something called linear interpolation Okay, let me erase all this now. Okay, so this minus that over this, um, let's say, let me, they do it differently, let me do it again, okay? So this minus that over this minus that is equal to this minus that over that minus that so the linear interpolation actually comes from the fact that if you have a linear change in a small ranges like that the change is always linear approximated a linear change and along the along the line along the linear line right uh, along the linear line the slope is the same so if you take different points and calculate the slope for this curve, uh, it has to be equal along the uh, along the line, linear line. Okay, that's why it's called linear interpolation. So basically, what we are doing is equilibrating the slopes and trying to figure out an unknown value from here. Okay, so I can also write it this way. So I can also say z minus point ninety nine zero over. 0 0.8125 minus 0 0.797 is equal to 0 0.95 minus 0 0.9 is equal to 0 0.8209 minus 0 0.797. So there is also this way you can write it. It doesn't matter. At the end, it gives you the same thing. Okay, so it should give you the z. So in we figured out inside the error function is equal to 0.93. So this term here, this term is the value is 0 0.93. All right, so uh, solve it for d. If you solve it for d, which I'm trying to figure out, it is x squared over 4 z squared times t. Okay, so all we have to do is now figure out the diffusion coefficient. And we are given the x, 
yes right and of course be careful with the units okay and we are we calculated c the time is given be careful convert to seconds because the units of the diffusion coefficient is in seconds so at the end you end up with calculating the diffusion coefficient Now next, remember the problem is asking for the temperature and the diffusion coefficient is a de dependence of temperature. So I need to know the diffusion coefficient equation, which was d is equal to d naught exponential term minus q over rt. So if I know this one, and if I if I know these things for the that iron carbon system, then I should be able to since this is a constant, I should be able to calculate the temperature. So in this case, this equation is solved for T, and T is therefore activation energy over R. Of course, this is they use the ln form. What was the ln form? Ln d minus is equal to ln d naught minus q over rt okay so solve this for t and it is gonna give you that right now all you have to do there will be certain tables where you figure out in the in the poem in, the, in your book it is the table 5 2 okay table 5 2 will give you information about d naught the act D naught constant and activation energies for different systems. So what do you have as a diffusing species? What is your host metal? Based on that, you can re read information about D naught, this one, and the activation energy. So try to look at the table to read this number because uh, in the exam I will give the table and you should be able to read these a constants depending on your system okay the systems are e e very easily defined be careful what your diffusing species here is carbon what is the host metal it is iron in FCC okay in FCC okay it is defined FCC iron so based on that you read the numbers of the uh, constants d naught and the q okay so look at the table and read these numbers yourself okay don't just uh, rely on the fact they are given in this problem because in the exam or in your homeworks basically you will have to read this table okay so from that information the temperature can be solved basically if you solve the, that equation of course, it's going to give you the Cal in terms of Kelvin. Depending on how it's asked, you can convert it to degree C. But at the end, this is how we find the temperature. All right, guys. So, basically, uh, that's it. Uh, in terms of this chapter, we learned diffusion... We learned the types of diffusions and we learned uh, the diffusion mathematical equations, how they are calculated and how diffusion coefficient is actually a temperature dependent process and time dependent process, temperature dependent process and uh, how with increasing temperature the diffusion coefficient is also increasing. And these are the things we learned and we learned that diffusion is very important for different processes that are taking place uh, in material science and uh, like the um, like basically phase change right uh, phase transformations and uh, corrosion oxidation in semiconducting industry how it is being used or how in surface treatments uh, this information is being used and so it's important to be able to calculate some time information temperature information 
uh, for diffusion using the tables given to us in equations.